Hello, everyone. I'm Thane Rosenbaum. I'm the creative director of the Forum on Life, Culture, and Society at Turo University. And welcome to the Folks Conversation Series tonight in recognition of Pride Month and also perhaps even more importantly for my purposes, in recognition of this really wonderful, great book written by my good friend, Jamie Kirchick. The book is entitled Secret City, uh, The Hidden History of Gay Washington, which I can announce to every one of our folks audience around the world is just uh, several hours ago, hit as number nine on the New York Times book review list, number nine, and it's got a bullet. So it's on its way up. Uh, and that's just great news. Um, and we have tonight my good friend, Jamie Kirchick, who is a first tier public intellectual. He has had his byline with the New York Times, the Atlantic, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post and other major publications. Uh, he is uh, a, an incredibly talented writer and this book is a great read. And there's a, there's a very good reason uh, that it's already on the New York Times uh, book review list. Imagine, imagine if you will, that you live in the most powerful city in the world. And because of your, a set of your talents, you've also have gotten yourself very close to the seat of power in places like the State Department, uh, the uh, White House, uh, the Senate floor, uh, the CIA, uh, and except for one thing, you are in possession of a career ending secret. And that secret is about you, that you're gay. And that's what this book is about. It's about uh, uh, um, some of the most compelling stories of people who existed from the uh, period of the New Deal until the end of the century, the year 2000, in various administrations at very high levels of government uh, who uh, were essentially outed, their lives were destroyed, ruined, um, and their contribution to America was formidable, uh, but it had to come to a premature end. Uh, that's what this book is about. Um, so again, we have our, my friend Jamie Kirchick, who is also the author of the book, The End of Europe, Dictators, uh, Demagogues, and the Coming of the Dark Age. Uh, Jamie, welcome. Thank you, Thane, for having me. Of course. If you're watching us live on YouTube, I know there are many of you out there, welcome. Uh, make sure that you sign up for our YouTube channel and go to folks.org uh, and sign up for our email list so you'll have uh, advanced notice of future events. And of course, if you have a question for Jamie, uh, leave it in the Q&A box on Zoom and uh, hopefully we'll be able to try to get to it. Jamie, as I just told the audience, it is a great read and it reads like a thriller but it's a paradox, right? That it reads like a thriller because it is in so many ways like a spy novel. It just so happens that there were these incredible, I will say characters in American history, uh, enormously talented, uh, some of whom had a role to play in inventing the CIA, the predecessor of the CIA, the OSS, uh, counterintelligence and uh, counter espionage techniques were in many ways pioneered by these people. And they were, they were homosexuals uh, hiding a secret and uh, living in their secret city. Um, there is sort of a paradox about that, that it, it, it is, a, it is a, in many ways about counter espionage. Uh, and it's about people that really understood the value of keeping holding their secrets. Well, yeah, if you think about it, gay people in this particular era, and we're talking about the 1940s, 50s, uh, were uniquely skilled or uniquely uh, positioned to be spies because to be a gay person in this era meant you had to pretend to be somebody else. You had to hide a secret. Um, you needed to dissimulate. And so as it happens, there were a number of gay men and women in the OSS, the predecessor to the CIA. There's one who I write about quite extensively. His name was Donald Downs. Yeah. Um, One of my favorites in the book. Yeah, he was a Yale graduate, like many of the. <laughs> we'll get to that in a minute. Yeah, the CIA came came from Yale, um, and he really sort of pioneered the use of, you know, romance or sort of um, uh, the use of kind of sex as a tool of espionage. He, yeah, as you point out in the book, Samson and Delilah. 
Well, that's yeah. Espionage goes all the way. You could say sex involved in espionage goes yes. back. To Samson right. And Goliath. You using so, sex as a way to gain right. information, inside so, information. Yeah. So his job was to spy on the various neutral embassies in Washington in World War II. And so he recruited a number of, you know, very handsome young men to <laughs> seduce the secretaries yeah. at the embassy of Vichy, France, at the embassy of Francoist Spain, and use that to sort of get access um, to the buildings so they could then, you know, hack the, the cipher codes and, and um, translate the message of the, the messages that, that they were sending back it, it, and forth. It's yeah. interesting, Jamie, because in some ways, everyone was obsessed at this time about homosexuals, but no one seemed to be uh, concerned about the moral significance of this counterintelligence technique of like, you know, using sex as a way to gaining information. I don't know, I think in the book you said that there were some people that questioned the morality of that, but, but it's, it's weird that, it, that in a country or at least in a government that was so obsessed, obsessed with homosexuality that this other piece to it the sexualization of gathering information was of lesser concern to them. Well, I think in, during World War II, they really needed, you know, every warm body to, <laughs> to be involved in the. And so even though during World War II, that was when the military formally instituted its policy of banning homosexuals in the military, there were actually very few homosexuals weeded out because right. at the end of the day, the U.S. Army needed everyone. And I think, I don't, the, the numbers in the book, I think it was only about 10,000 men were excluded from the military on account of homosexuality, which out of the, right. you know, over 10 million people right. who served. And so World War II actually becomes this very important moment right. in American gay history and really forming a gay consciousness. The notion right. that, you know, gay people aren't alone. You have all these people from all over the country, from rural parts of the country. They're coming together for the first time because of the mass mobilization. They're being deployed to military bases. So, you know, San Francisco first really becomes the gay city when you have all these young people being deployed there, right, to go off to Asia. Um, and there's many women being recruited too, by the way, to the Women's Army Corps, the WAX. And right. that almost becomes, it becomes a very kind of lesbian a milieu, right? And so World War II becomes, it's a very important moment in-, in Right. Gay well, you also point out that it starts even earlier with the New Deal because yes. the, the New Deal ramps up Washington as a real bureaucracy that is in need of talent, yeah. right? It, it needs a lot of talent. So all of a sudden people who were gay, who were stuck in small towns in the Midwest- Exactly. Are introduced to a completely different world in which they're not only involved in the in the culture of Washington, but the sexuality of Washington, because it, tra it attracted other people of similar sex sexual uh, predispositions. Yeah, the you know the the history of gay people in the 20th century is really a history of urbanization. Right. It is it is people fleeing small towns and moving to cities. And you know we often hear about everyone knows about San Francisco. San Francisco really becomes. I mean, I, I mentioned the World War II part. It really doesn't become like the the really gay city that we know it as until after Stonewall. Of course. In the 1970s, right? right. You're saying Washington, D.C. precedes. It's a lot earlier. Washington's yeah. a lot earlier. It's during yeah. the New Deal. It's during yeah. the New Deal when yeah. the size of the city is growing exponentially. Yeah. Um, and it's not until really World War II that this becomes a problem in the sense that homosexuality right. goes from being just a sin or a mental problem then it gets transformed into being a national security threat. Right, which so is- word, Which is, well, we can talk about that. Yeah, no, we're, which is a key yeah. thing. But you know, Jamie, it's more than just the keeping of secrets in this book and saying, well, you know, if you think about it, gay people really, you know, are very sensitive to that. And so they would be naturally born spy masters yeah. of the trade craft. But you point out something here that is interesting in an age of, um, gender uh, identity and sexual identity. I don't even know whether there's even an, you know, an issue because you were so unapologetic in the book in pointing out the unique talents of gay people, right? And how, you know, and it's, just, it's like, you know, it reinforces a lot of stereotypes unapologetically. And I actually, as, as a straight man, was like very proud of this idea to say, well, you, in the book, you, you were unapologetic. You're saying, Let's, you don't say it this way, let's be honest. Yeah. You're talking about highly educated people who are multilingual, 
right, who are cultivated in the arts, uh, music, uh, literature, uh, fine art. Uh, you know, these, if you're going to, in, you know, to send someone to a foreign embassy, you know, uh, and have them try to gain information, wouldn't it be good to have someone who dresses really well and knows a lot about fine wine? <laughs> because you point this out, it's a na it makes total sense. Of yeah. course, gay men would be great at this. Right, and it, and it does make sense, but then things begin to change <laughs> after the war um, right. with the rise of McCarthyism and the Cold War um, and the communist threat. And that is when communism becomes associated with homosexuality in the public mind. Right. Because in February 1950, Joe McCarthy gives his famous speech where he's yeah. holding up, you know, the list of 205 communists in his hand. And then less than three weeks later, uh, Dean Acheson, the secretary of state, yeah. he's called to testify before the Senate about these charges. And in passing, one of his deputies just sort of mentions, yes, and we had we, we had to get rid of 91 homosexuals from the State Department over the past three years. And then all of a sudden, we have the communist threat that Joe McCarthy was, you know, railing about. And then there's this new threat of sexual deviance right. in the government. And they, become, and they become conflated. Right. But you point out, and you just said it here, that the number casually is, is said at the hearing, 91 people, but the uh, seismic shock that it affected, what? Yeah. There are 91 homosexuals in the State yeah. Department? Are you kidding me? And, well, and I, should, I, I forgot to mention this. There's another the, important the Kinsey, development. The Kinsey Report. The Kinsey Report in 1948. This is a major moment yeah. in uh, American history, sexual history, gay history, is the Kinsey Report comes out with its famous finding that 10% of all white men, it was only white men that they studied, 10% of all American white men between the ages of 18 and 65 had a three-year period where they were exclusively homosexual. So that's, you know, however you want to define it. But there was number, even a worse statistic from the point of view of the fair deviancy that 37% At men, some point of all men that at had point, at had least homosexual some, some in homosexual experience. In childhood, whenever, right? When they were a teenage to whenever, yes. This is shocking. It shocks right. the country because prior to that, you know, homosexuals were, first of all, you hardly ever used the word homosexual, even that, I mean, right. even that was considered too much. Um, you know, there's the, there's the, there's a, a scandal involving a senator in 1942, and one of his colleagues refers to homosexuality on the floor of the United States Senate as the crime too loathsome to mention, right? Yeah. So that's how, yeah. that's how it's referred to. And so for, the, for this report to come out, and it's a huge bestseller, by the way, it sells something like a quarter of a million copies. Yeah. Um, I don't know why. I mean, you think my book is thick. The Kinsey Report. Was, you know, <laughs> and, it, and it's not well written, unlike, unlike this. And it's, not, and it's written in very academic jargon, whatever. It is an earthquake, uh, right? And it sort of sends shockwaves across the country. Yeah. And this is all happening in 1948. The Cold War is heating up. It's the Berlin crisis. You know, the communists are on the march in Asia and in Eastern Europe. And then, and then you know, and then, then there's the His Chambers case, which... There's two chapters in that. Book. Yeah, we'll go the first great, the first great spy drama. Yeah, uh, the we'll American talk about Cold that. War. And there's a whole there's a whole homoerotic subtext yeah. to that that I discuss in the book. So all these things are happening in the late 1940s. So that when McCarthy comes around in 1950, it gets to the point where the mail that's being that he's receiving from people across the country only 25 percent of the mail is about communists in the government. The rest is all about sexual deviance. Right. And so this is very much on the minds of the American of the American people. But it also coincides, as you point out in the book, Jamie, with a lot of other paranoia uh, that affects the country. Right. Uh, the Cold War, the Berlin blockade, you know, the capturing of, you know, Eastern Europe by the Soviet yeah. Union, the first successful uh, testing of a nuclear weapon by the Soviet Union. So that you're talking about a country that was primed. Yes. For fearing about threats to national security and certain levels of vulnerability. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Um, and I think it was one, one of the many things I learned from this, this book um, is to be really suspicious of moral panics and right. hysterias. Um, right. The belief that gay people were more susceptible to blackmail and were therefore needed to be 
expelled from government was something that everyone believed. Um, there were a handful of people who contested this, one of whom I write about Max Lerner, who was a great, yeah, liberal, yeah, yeah. A great liberal journalist who did, who did a great series for the New York Post, yeah. which, which used to be a liberal paper, believe it or not. Yeah. Um, he did a 12 part series on this, but pretty much everyone across the board uh, believed that gay people were more susceptible to right. treat them because they right. and, and then there was actually no basis for this. The, the, the Defense Department right. commissioned, commissioned a study in the early 1990s after the Cold War when the gays and the military debate was raging during the Clinton administration. And they studied 106 cases of espionage and they discovered that only six of the people were gay yeah. and none of them but had committed blackmail. No, no, no. blackmail for right. money or for other reasons, right? right. And the only example that is ever cited, um, and I read about it in the book, was this Austro-Hungarian counterintelligence chief in 1913. This is Redl, is that his Colonel name? Colonel Radel, Colonel Alfred Radel. There's actually a great movie about him by Istvan Shebo, the Hungarian director. Called and Radl. this is the only actual known example. Well, not only that, well, it's not even an example. He was sending privileged confidential information to the Russians. Um, he was gay. Yeah, but there was there. He wasn't doing it because he was gay. He was doing yeah. it for money. He had a very right. expensive right. lifestyle. It wasn't even that wasn't related to that. Even that wasn't related. But the Austro-Hungarian regime was so embarrassed by this right. that they sort of released this out to the public, and it becomes very deeply ingrained. And everybody in believes that it's possible. Alan, Alan anyway. Dulles is writing essays about the first civilian director yeah. of the Central Intelligence Agency. In fact, Alan Dulles's biography, his his. His real the, the 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 leading biography of him. It begins with Alan Dulles as a young diplomat in Vienna yeah. during the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It's he's there in like 1916, so it's during World War One, and it describes the city being still in shock over the Radel scandal, and it's yeah. this cloud of treason yeah. and homosexuality and espionage is still sort of hovering over still there. Is still there three years after lingering, it's lingering, right? And so yeah. it's very deeply implanted in his mind. Yeah. And then the, one, one of the one of the first directors of the CIA is giving testimony to the to the Senate in 1950. They're they're um, discussing policies to expel gay people from government, and the senators ask him, you know, can you tell us about homosexuals being you know, susceptible to blackmail. And the only example he comes up with is the Radel case. Is the Radel, and it's not even our country. It's not even Jamie, true. hold on one second. Something is on that has to be turned off. Hold on. Sorry about that, Jamie and, and audience. That was the first time that Siri decided to play music during a folks event. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, so what do you think about the idea though that, uh, and it's, you talk a lot about this in the book, and maybe we've covered this slightly, but it does seem as if Foreign Service, the State Department, CIA, that's where, you know, the White House, right? That's where people ended up. Not the Interior Department, not so much the Department of Defense, not Treasury. You know, it does, again, it speaks to something about, you know, and I, and I wonder whether that's even still the case today. Um, um, I think that the closet um, in a particular era, the closet uh, bred a lot of skills um, that made gay, cer certain gay men maybe perhaps disproportionately more uh, equipped or, or better, better equipped to succeed in a city like Washington. Um, there's this term, the best little boy in the world, which is a, a memoir by an author named Andy Tobias. And it's a... Yeah. About he grew up in the 50s and 60s and 70s, and he writes about you know when you're a young gay man and you are not you know dating girls or you're trying to just you're trying to keep people from looking at you uh, suspiciously. You channel all your energy into schoolwork, uh, into extracurricular activities, into pleasing your teachers. You become very discreet, um, and these sorts of skills I think bred. Uh, a certain kind of type of gay man who was very successful in Washington. Yeah. Um, and so I say that Washington, again, in the period that I'm writing about, Washington was simultaneously the gayest and the most anti-gay city in America. <laughs> at the same time. But so also, yeah. But also, there were, it also f attracted people like FDR, like John F. Kennedy, 
you know, you point out that even in situations where presidencies, because the book is so much divided up into various yeah. the presidencies and how they how homosexuals fared at very high level positions, it does seem like there were certain presidents that were sophisticated on their own, maybe because yeah. they went to boarding schools yeah. where there was, at, at, you know, they were accepting of homosexuality, even if they didn't participate, they knew what it was. And it frankly yeah. didn't, it didn't freak them out, right? That yeah. they were just, and it's so interesting the way you present it in the book, you don't even make a big issue of it. you're saying, look, there's certain kind of people like JFK. I love the part in the book where, where you're saying when two of the homosexuals note his ass, his butt. It's Gore, it's Gore Vidal and Tennessee Williams. Oh, right, right, right. Specifically, right. Artists, they note his his butt. And when they mention it later, he's he's very complimented that two gay men yeah. was checking he's flattered. out. He's flattered. He yeah. feels that's a nice thing to hear that these two men in particular noticed me, my behind. And it does seem like um, I think what is it with um uh, Sumner Wells, I suspect, with FD, with with uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Am I right? Yeah. Was, he's to him. It's always look. You know, my friend. Sometimes he gets a little drunk, and when he gets drunk, maybe something like that happened. As if he was always trying FDR's to. FDR's initial, yeah. FDR's initial reaction to the uh, the accusation that his undersecretary of state Sumner Wells was yeah. was propositioning porters on the train. Uh, was well, he's not doing it on company time, is he? Um, <laughs> but I think so. There is there is a class element to this, this sort of aristocratic um, tolerance of it, personal tolerance, right? And it's important to note, you know, the policies of the Roosevelt administration, the Kennedy administration, were not in any way enlightened on this issue, right? They exactly. Were, they're, they're, but but yes, personally, FDR, you could say, and JFK were more comfortable around this issue, or they could sort of understand it in a way. Well, and there, is a there is a class element to this, and it actually becomes quite apparent in sort of the bureaucratic warfare between the FBI yes. and the CIA. In the Explain that. that. I love that part in the book. Yeah. There's a great line from Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who said, in the era of the security clearance, it was the Harvard men who were checked and the Fordham men who were doing the checking. <laughs> right? And I taught, I taught at Fordham for 23 years. Yeah. So I, I love that line because I understood... So what you yeah. were talking about, working class Irish, right? White Irish, ethnic, white ethnic, Central Eastern European, Catholic, Catholic. They, right. they staff the FBI. They staff as opposed, the FBI. as opposed to the CIA, and the Ivy State League Department. educated, higher yeah. socioeconomic class, right. elite, uh, uh, the elites in some ways, and boarding then, school and Western kids. societies. You know, it's often the case that upper the upper classes are associated with effem effeminacy. Right, because they don't work with their hands. <laughs> they're point. not. They're not engaged. Right, and so effeminacy becomes associated with homosexuality. Yeah. This is one of the reasons why I think in American culture there's such an association of British people with homosexuality. Right, because we look up towards British people as we see them as being of a higher class, and that goes back centuries. Right, that goes back to our our founding. Well, you so also often, point. Yeah. No, no, I'm sorry, but you remind you me. You often see in American pop culture, you know, a British character in a movie or a novel. More often than not, he's going to be probably upper upper class, maybe effeminate, and maybe gay. But you point out in the book the that, trope. He, yeah. that even here in the United States, State Department officials even affected a sort of quasi British accent, which is I, that's Dean that, Acheson. Dean Acheson. Yeah, Dean, that way. Yeah. yeah, that that there was a certain kind of elitism that was associated yeah. with State Department people that they they sounded British. They didn't. They in no sure. way did they represent a Fordham man. Well, it's that Atlantic. It's that it's that old Bill Buckley, Gore yeah. Vidal. Again, the two of them <laughs> had very different political views. But it's that sort of mid-Atlantic, transatlantic, you might even call it, accent. Yes, and this becomes in the early years of the Cold War when America seems to be losing um, and McCarthy and the Republican right are blaming the State Department uh, and they're blaming a, a kind of clique. They're saying that this is all deliberate, right? It's not just that the Soviets are strong or the red Chinese are actually, you know, legitimately winning over converts to their cause. It's that this is part of a deliberate conspiracy, a communist conspiracy. And there's a little twist of lavender to it, right? It's not just a red scare, it's a lavender scare as well. And so the lavender scare that also integrates this other accusation that it's not just homosexuality, but that there's a sort of a long history or at least a history in many of these lives of their association with communism in their early career. 
right? And so there, in some of these instances, you know, you had two things going on at the same time, although one was, I guess, more immutable. For instance, Whitaker Chambers renounces right. communism, right? Yes. But he doesn't renounce the fact that he had been once gay and he pays the well, price. Well, he renounces, he, he admits it to the FBI. He would never admit it in public, obviously. Right. Uh, which is which is what leads me to say that actually being a homosexual was even more dangerous than being a communist. Right. Um, the fact that, you know, if you were a communist or you had been a communist, you can repent and convert and do what Whitaker Chambers did. Right. The homosexual could not do that. I mean, once you were tarred as gay, it was over for you. There was no uh, uh, walking back from that. But, you know, in the book, you point out and I find this fascinating. It's almost as if we point, we look to our enemies <coughs> and we saw them as gay. Yes. Right. We look to the Soviets and we saw them as in there, there all kinds of accusations. Oh, the in, Nazis, in, the in fact, I mean, before the Soviets, yeah. during World War II. Right. Um, and I have a whole chapter on this is the, uh, in, in high levels of the US government and the intelligence services, they genuinely believed that the Nazis were a gay cabal. You know, it's not just the producers, the musical. Like, I, know, actually, I was just going to say, it reminds there's like me. A, there's like a basis, um, not 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 that there's a basis that the Nazis were gay, but this was a real, this was this was a believed, uh, a widely believed conception. And I came across a proposal um, that reached the offices of the um, the OSS, where they were actually proposing to recruit uh, patriotic homosexual men because <laughs> they couldn't officially serve in the military, right? Yeah, to recruit them to infiltrate the Nazi high command. Uh, and I come across all different sorts of references in various government reports, intelligence reports. Um, the OSS did you know, two very thick um, sort of you know, psychological reports on the Nazis and Adolf Hitler in which they elaborate at length upon the belief that gay men are more um, predisposed to support fascism. Uh, because they have less to lose and they're more willing to support a revolutionary movement. So this is something that's pretty widely believed. Um, and then, of course, just a couple of years later, it's gays or communists. Um, and there's no kind of realization that this is uh, in, inconsistent. I mean, homosexuality becomes associated with whatever is um, the kind of societal boogeyman at that at that point. But in this instance, and boy, at least in with respect to Hitler, right? There does seem to even have been somewhat of a basis, like Ernst Rome or is it Rome? There's Ernst Rome, right? But yes, his existence though becomes sort of um, the basis on which the entire, you know, they they then say, well, the entire Nazi party is is riddled with homosexuals, right? Because there was um, one Nazi there's official, one guy, was- and there and there may have been, you know, he may have had some guys, men around him who were gay as well, right? Oh, but this this then becomes the basis of a pretty, you know, widely shared belief. Although in the book you say, I think someone says that even the Hitler youth was suggestive of homosexuality yes. and that that some some rumor or perhaps there was some truth that Hitler's bodyguards were all notably gay. That's what they're, this is again, this is all speculation, but this yeah. is what um, I think one of the defectors that they that the OSS was relying upon I for see. their reports, he claimed that all of Hitler's bodyguards were gay. And he actually, in this OSS report, they also say that there is a homoerotic element to the stab in the back theory. Yes. And he's afraid, <laughs> that he's afraid of being sodomized or something. In the and back, so, from the back. It's very bizarre. I mean, it's very bizarre. But. Tell us a little about Sumner Wells. So Sumner Wells was the Undersecretary of State in the Roosevelt administration. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I didn't mean that. Sorry. We t- I want to talk about David Walsh. David Walsh, right. Senator David Walsh of Massachusetts yeah. was um, had been the governor of Massachusetts. He was the first Catholic elected governor of Massachusetts, believe it or not, in, the, in 1914, I believe. Then he was the first Democrat elected to the Senate for Massachusetts since the Civil War. If you remember, this is back when Massachusetts was a Republican yeah. state. Yeah. Um, he's an isolationist Democrat, so he's sort of an ad- he's an adversary of FDR. And I think he pay- also supported packing the court. Um, I don't you know he opposed packing the court. He was he was opposed to FDR. Oh, right, he was opposed to on all court. sorts of issues. Right. Yes, right. This was this was back when the parties, by the way, had much more ideological diversity within right. them. Right. So the Democratic Party was a coalition of various different interest groups and ideological persuasions and the Republicans were the same. It's not like it is now 
um, where there's really no such thing as a liberal Republican anymore or a conservative Democrat. So Walsh was, was a more conservative Democrat. And um, in May 1942, just again, to give you an example of how much things have changed, the New York Post, which at the time was a liberal newspaper, um, it was owned by Dorothy Schiff, um, who would own the paper. She would, she would eventually sell it to Rupert Murdoch in the 1970s. Right. Right. This is the 1942. It's, the New York Post is a, is a, had just converted from broadsheet to tabloid format. Uh, and it's very convenient because they come out with this story in May 1942, alleging that a Senator X, they don't name him at this point, has been frequenting a male brothel in Brooklyn, right near the Brooklyn Navy Yard, that is frequented by Nazi spies. Uh, and they basically beat the drums for several days. They say, you know, more revelations are coming out. They report more details. And then they actually announce on their front page that Senator X is David Walsh of Massachusetts. And this constitutes the first outing in American politics. And it's interesting because while FDR is simultaneously defending S Sumner Wells, Sumner Wells he is quietly supporting what the Post is doing. And in fact, the general counsel of the New York Post is a man named Morris Ernst, who was also the general counsel of the ACLU. And so it just goes to show you that back in the 1940s, you know, anyone was fair game and homophobia was a weapon that anyone would use. Right. Even, Even the ACLU were ACLU not ACLU general were counsel not right. and, and the, you right. know, the New York Post, the liberal intelligentsia, the New Deal, you know, they were waging this war uh, against David Walsh, who it turns out may have been, was probably gay, but was not at the brothel. It was a case of mistaken identity. Um, and the Post would never admit that. They would, they would discover it in their own sort of uh, ex post facto investigation. They, they would hire a private eye to basically do the work that they should have done as newspaper journalists. But the private eye discovers through checking the Senate attendance record that Walsh could not have been at, right. at this brothel when, when he was said. But this is a major scandal, although the Post is the only paper that would really cover it. I mean, or, or that, that, that would mention Walsh's name. No mm -hmm. other paper, no other media outlet would mention Walsh's name. It just, it just shows you how different yeah. uh, the attitude was. This was such a, a hot button issue at the time. So in the case of Alger Hiss, however, there we have a situation. Uh, maybe you can explain the relationship he had two perjury trials, and eventually this is a State Department official who is accused of espionage, although he's not prosecuted for espionage because I think the statute of limitations had run. Fire. But he is prosecuted for perjury because uh, Whitaker Chambers says that he had given him something in his pumpkin patch. He has yeah. microfilm uh, of, of evidence of, that were supposed to be sent to the Soviet Union. So, right. Witter, so uh, Alger Hiss, of course, denies everything, including any, uh, any allegation that he's also gay and that this, again, falls into this other category that happens in the book of this unrequited love, right? It comes up a lot in the book as if, how do we explain what yes. happened here? Oh, well, right. of course we can explain. Whitaker Chambers made a pass at Alger Hiss. Alger Hiss rejected him and he never forgot it. And that's why he's trying to frame Alger yeah. Hiss, right? And that- basically, Yeah, this basically becomes the um, not so subtle defense strategy of the Hiss team. They don't explicitly use the word homosexuality, but they um, basically say he's insane uh, and they insinuate it in the trial. They wage a whisper campaign against Hiss in the press, in kind of literary political circles in Washington and um, New York. Uh, uh, and then Hiss, for the rest of his life, would basically allege this. He would say that Chambers was practicing fairy vengeance against him. And again, this is another example, right, of kind of progressives, liberal-minded people um, using homophobia against their political enemies. I mean, Alger Hiss was the, you know, uh, he was called the Jeeves of the Eastern Establishment. I mean, this yeah. was the guy who worked for Oliver Wendell Holmes, Harvard Educated. He was the president of the Carnegie Endowment. Um, he had all the right associations, um, but they basically tried to smear Chambers as a spurned uh, homosexual. Yeah. So is there a, um, I know you've been thinking about this a long time, and I'm not sure if the book is sort of a revisionist thinking about Whitaker Chambers. Is there a sympathetic 
feeling here about what had happened to him, because in the end, he, you know, perhaps was a patriotic American, because as you point out in the book, right, the Soviet Union, when it collapses, we actually discover <laughs> that Alger Hiss, very much like, you know, Julius Rosenberg, same, D, I think it's the same uh, decryption files. Uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, the, the, Verona, um, the Verona. The Venona papers. Venona, right. The Venona. No, Hiss papers. was actually Hiss was absolutely a spy. Chambers was was right. Um, yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think he was a tortured soul. Um, you read his autobiography, Witness, which is one of the great autobiographies, by the way, of of the twentieth century. Um, and it's it's interesting. I mean, you read his descriptions of working in the communist underground. And he's talking about, you know, meeting his fellow messengers, his contacts to, you know, deliver secret information. And um, they would have to meet at like a newspaper stand and they would signal to each other covertly yeah. and then go off into a street corner. And it's, it reads a lot like cruising, you know, like cruising for sex, mm -hmm. which Chambers was also doing. He admits that to the FBI. And so you can't help when you, when you have this knowledge um, of what of that Chambers was leading not only one secret life but a, but another secret life. He wasn't leading just a secret life as a communist agent, a communist spy. He was also leaving leading a life as a secret homosexual. You read his memoir, and there are these moments when you see these two secret lives are intertwined, and but that he, that case becomes quite important, I think, um, in sort of establishing in many prominent Washington minds this association between communism and homosexuality and espionage and treason. But there, in the early years after the Hiss trial, there was sympathy for Hiss and, and, and a derision toward Chambers for smearing someone's you know, uh, uh, reputation with this sexual innuendo, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I mean, it's important decades. to keep that, that what, you know, I think you say in the book that Chambers attempts two different suicides related to this i it's it's um it's alluded to in his book he he on multiple occasions attempts to commit suicide and there's one where he doesn't again he's not explicit about it but he says that the his forces were going to you know they were they were spreading a rumor so degraded and so horrible um and that is sort of spurs him to this suicide attempt and so one is led to believe that this, you know, the, this information of his secret past as a, as a gay man in the 1930s, um, that this might have absolutely induced him to a suicide attempt. So the book sort of, we'll, we'll skip around a little, but the book sort of ends uh, on the Clinton administration because it comes to an end at the end of the 20th century. And you say some interesting things about Clinton, uh, one of which, which I, I guess I hadn't thought about it, but it was pretty plain, which was that he was the first political candidate yeah. for president who actually actively solicited, courted the gay vote and received Absolutely. it and actually and, and received it. And yeah. I think you describe a situation where uh, one of his uh, advisors with his husband, or I don't think they were legally married at the time, his partner were dancing at one of the inaugural yeah. balls, which in itself must have been <clears throat> just remarkable for 1992. Uh, but at the same time, right? I think there are people in the gay liberation movement that feel that Clinton's administration was disappointing with respect to at least what the uh, Defense of Marriage Act and don't, don't ask and don't tell. Gays right? in the military. Yeah. Yeah, it was a mixed record, but for the purposes of the story I'm telling, right, which yeah. begins, which begin, I mean, which, which, which begins with, well, it's the era of the, the, the specter of homosexuality. Right. And that begins around World War II. Um, and it ends with the Clinton administration in the sense that in 1995, Bill Clinton lifts the ban on gay people receiving security clearances. And right. so from that point forward, being gay is no longer um, a legal impediment to serving your country. That's not to say that the closet doesn't disappear. I'd obviously- Now, just disappear. to remind me in the book, you say that this the, this begins with an executive order in the Eisenhower administration? That's when, yes, in 1953 is when right. Eisenhower signs an executive order that bans gay people from serving in any positions um, in government and explicitly bars uh, gay people from holding security clearances. That's 1953. And it's not until 42 years later that, well, in 1975, the civil service element of that is lifted. 
Right. And then 20 years later in 1995. The, the security, clearance. security clearance. So um, one of my favorite political heroes is Bayard Rustin, uh, who is very, it's very interesting here. Two, there are two, pers- two, of, two people in the book who you point out were publicly out. And so therefore the, 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 the accusation that they were susceptible to foreign power influence or blackmail doesn't work if they admittedly admit, say, look, I'm gay. And I think you're saying yeah. that, that Rustin is the only person, an only political the figure, first. The, the, first. First, the first political figure who survived this attack. Yeah. Right. And, and, and did not, in the end, he did not lose his career. Right. Yeah. Can, you, can you talk a little about that? Yes. This is one of the, what I really try to do in this book is take all these moments, events, personalities that you think you know about and show yeah. you an element that you didn't know. And this is a very good example. This so one. that the March on Washington, we all know about the March on Washington. It's one of the greatest events in 20th century American history. Less known is that the organizer was a gay man, a rather openly gay man for his time named Bayard Rustin. And then two weeks before the march, Strom Thurmond, the leading segregationist in the Senate, uh, outs Rustin on the floor. And I'm not, I mean, outs him in the sense that the average American didn't know Rustin was gay, right? Right. Civil rights leaders knew he was gay. Martin Luther King knew he was gay. But it was not widely advertised that Bayard Rustin was gay. Um, Strom Thurmond gets a, he, he, he has sent a police record of, of one of Rustin's arrests on a homosexual offense years earlier in Pasadena in California. How did a Senator get that? Probably the FBI. It was presumably given to him by the FBI. Um, so he denounces Rustin on the floor of the Senate and the leaders of the March on Washington have a choice to make. They can basically fire Rustin, um, say he's going off. We don't want to deal with this problem. We have this major event that we need to pull off. And this is a distraction. What they choose to do is actually to keep him on and they defend him. Um, And I think they do this for a number of reasons. One is that, you know, it was not, it was known to them that he was gay and that he had had these offenses in the past, which by the way, if you were a gay man, if you were a sexually active gay man in the 1950s or 60s, you were at grave risk of being arrested. Uh, and many, many, many were. Uh, it's just important to have that context. I mean, this is before the era of, you know, grinder and right. you know, gay bars, or, I mean, gay men would seek sex in public parks and restrooms, public spaces. That was really the only way, because our society, that, that it, it drove male, gay male sexuality underground. Um, so they, the civil rights leaders defend Rustin. And I think they don't, they don't want to give a scalp to, um, Strom Thurmond. But do you, uh, I mean, do, do, I'm sorry, I was just, but do you think it has something to do with the fact that this is a civil rights movement that holds itself together? In other words, it's very different when you think about the presidents that even when they were loyal, as you describe them, yeah. in the end, they couldn't say, right, Lyndon Johnson loses one of his aides who is like a son to him. Right. right. I think he's thought of it. I think there's even a second aid. These guys never make it to the White House because he gets right. rid of them. Right. Uh, and you that there's something different about the politics of a president in the Oval Office versus the a, a, a movement made up of minorities that are saying, you know what, this undermines our whole argument if we get rid of Bayard, right? I, I just wonder, there's just something very special because remember you point out something in the book, was it, is it Carmel Afi? Is that his yeah. name? Yeah. You point out that Carmel Afi is also out. He doesn't question, yeah. there's no question that he's gay. He doesn't deny it, but he doesn't get saved from McCarthy no. or whatever the lavender school and right. care. No one protects him because the executive branch will get rid of their own for right. political reasons and and, I'm wondering whether you think that might be some reason. That's an interesting um, perspective and I hadn't thought about it, but yes, I do think it's right. Um, in this, perhaps they were less, well, I mean, well we, we, we know the civil rights movement was very attuned to public opinion. Uh, they were very concerned about their public image, right? I mean, Martin Luther King stressed nonviolence. Yeah. Um, you, you look at the behavior of 
the the sit-in demonstrators. They're all dressed immaculately. They are uh, behaving, you know, incredibly passive. That was the whole point: was to be passive and to allow, um, almost to invite violence against you. Yes, perhaps the deliberate Good point. goal was to show. Good point. To show the you know the evil of what was You're going saying, on. You're so saying they're very attuned. Br- bring to bring it on, right? That's yeah. The- the ethos. So they're very attuned. The civil rights leaders are they're very attuned to public opinion. Um, but I still think it's a pretty incredible decision yeah. to defend a man who w- was a sexual deviant. I mean, that was the term that was used, right? It wasn't gay, gay. Yeah. That, that really wasn't the term that we was, it wasn't a, he wasn't an openly gay man. He was a sexual deviant. Um, and they decided that he was more important to the movement. His skills were more important to the movement. And I also think that they just, they just genuinely believed that, you know, you, you, you give them a little and they'll take a lot, you know, and it's, yeah. and Strom Thurmond is not going to be, sati- he's not going to be yeah. satiated yeah. by sacrificing by Rustin, right? The right. man is an enemy of the movement and you have to defend your right. own against them. So one of the things you say in the book that I thought was original point was that the, a lot of gay gays and lesbians served in the civil rights movement in freedom rides. It reminded me of also that Jewish Americans before the Soviet Jewry movement also argued that they sort of learned the politics of movement politics through the civil rights movement. And I hadn't thought about like that many gay men and I guess women served in the civil rights movement. And so it clearly prepared them and galvanize them to actually take on the next fight for their own sexuality. Yeah, the the early gay rights movement, the Mattachine Society of, yeah. of Washington, absolutely 100% was modeling its strategy and its tactics on the civil rights movement. If you look at the first picket for gay equality outside the White House in 1965, it is all uh, men in coats and ties, suits and ties. It's all women with, you know, blouses and dresses below the knee. They're holding placards uh, with very simple, basic demands for equality. And they're marching, you know, in, a, in an oval uh, motion yeah. outside the White House. And it, it is very, I mean, clearly, Frank Kennedy, yeah. Frank Kennedy, who's the direct, who's the founder, yeah. co-founder, I mean, he is very much consciously modeling the movement on that mm. of, of the civil rights movement. For so Africa. in your mind, you know, the book sort of comes to this glorious end. It's a fabulous read, but it does beg the question, does the secret city still exist in some form? If we were to carry on for now, what would be three more presidencies, three and a half more presidencies? If there was a sequel to Secret City, would it be called Secret City 2 or would it be saying unsecreted city? Uh, given an era of gender identity and gender sexual uh, and gender and yeah. sexual identity, would we say that no one is hiding anymore? Well, I definitely think the the Bush administration um, during the whole debate over gay marriage, yeah, uh, there was a lot. I mean, the, the closet was really powerful force in Washington at that time. There was a lot of outing um, of staffers of staffers for Republican congressmen who opposed gay marriage. There was definitely a sense of fear. I can I, I know that because I was there for a part of it. So um, you're saying a, a chapter on George W. Bush would have been interesting to pick up on the very same problem. Yeah, I just didn't. I mean, just I didn't think I had anything new to report or no, say about no. that. I think it right. Was, I'm just saying, dude, it was written about a lot of the it time. It doesn't yes. mean that it's over. Right. I guess well, I I'm think asking. that now I think I think a lot's changed, actually, since the early 20th cent, the early 21st century. Um, the closet, yes, it still exists, but in a much more limited extent. Um, it doesn't really ex- exist in the government anymore, and it hasn't for a long time. There's, you know, homosexuality is not a bar to government service. Um, you look at Pete Buttigieg, uh, the first openly gay Senate confirmed member of the cabinet. That's a huge um, development uh, to go from where this book begins to where we are today. Yeah. So I don't think that the closet uh, or the secret city is, is much an issue. Um, the kind of the moralism, perhaps, and the use of, you know, accusations pertaining to sex, though that still lives on to this day. But um, I don't, I don't, I kind of feel like Donald Trump almost rendered obsolete 
uh, <laughs> the issue of sex and politics almost. Yeah. It's hard at this point to see, you know, someone's sexual peccadilloes being um, a factor. I mean, when you have like the Christian right supporting a thrice married, you know, yeah. sexually, uh, sexually unorthodox man. The, the, the moral States. argument is lost, right? It's hard to see this returning. I could be wrong, but it's, I think, I think we're past that. Do we have there been, I guess it goes without saying other secret cities. In other words, it just so happens that Washington DC is the seat of power, but I'm wondering whether there are certain industries that are still more closeted in a way that the government is not. That's a good question. Um, probably the Catholic Church, I would assume. There's a lot yeah, of- Yeah, clearly. Of you would say all know. religions conceivably. Religion, I think, yeah. I think religion is probably the last bastion of this. Mm -hmm. um, but there are definitely, I mean, I, again, I'm not an expert on this. I, would, I think there's certain uh, certain business sectors, perhaps, that right. might be more that might be more conservative when it comes to this. Um, right. You know, when you think about uh, white shoe law firms, you know, the, the story in the film Philadelphia gives you a real sense of, you know, the fear of AIDS and how yeah. that law and how that law firm responded to, you know, having a gay young partner. Um, of course, that's years ago, but still wonder whether that in on Wall Street or law firms wonder. You mentioned Buttigieg. Uh, I want to this. Here's a question from our audience. This comes from one of our board members, actually, Brett Feeder. He says, while several openly gay politicians have been successful in city, state and congressional and cabinet positions. And because you mentioned Buttigieg in cabinet position, do you agree that the extremely poor voter results in Secretary Buttigieg's presidential run was almost solely due to his homosexuality? And if so, how long do you think it will be before the American electorate, electorate is ready for a gay male president? Um, I don't see the evidence that Pete Buttigieg was harmed by his homosexuality. Um, in fact, I think it probably helped him. I think it made him um, a very interesting trailblazing candidate in a way that, frankly, if he had just been a straight Midwestern mayor of a small city, even though he's Harvard educated and all the other attributes that he had, I'm not sure that he would have stood out. I don't think he would have been on the cover of Time magazine. Right. If he was straight. Right. right. Um, so I'm actually I was actually very encouraged by his run for president. Mm. And in fact, most of the opposition to him. Uh, as far as the sexual orientation was concerned, did not seem to come from right-wing homophobes. It came from queer leftists. There was actually huh. a group called, uh, there was actually a group called Queers Against Pete. Um, and they would disrupt his campaign events because he wasn't queer enough, whatever that is supposed mm -hmm. to mean, right? So, no, I actually think he's a very transformative um, figure. Political figure. Absolutely. I I'm going to read something that actually appears on the last page because it's it really stood out to me. Um, I wanted to read something earlier, which I had neglected because we were having so much fun talking. But let me give also the audience a sense of what great writing is in this book. But it's also, this is a very, I think a very, um, I wouldn't say controversial, but it's something that I want you to answer. It says, the story of the secret city is the story of openness triumphing over concealment. Across the broad sweep of American history, no minority group has witnessed a more rapid transformation in its status in the eyes of the law and their fellow citizens than gay people during the second half of the 20th century. Now you can imagine some people saying, well, whoa, the civil rights movement, the civil rights act, the voting rights act. I mean, I actually think you've raised a very provocative point that it might actually be that the movement for gays and lesbians in the second half of the 20th century might have been you know, much more meteoric of a change, a sea change. Yeah, and there are lots of there are lots of people now. It's quite fashionable to say that, you know, those those civil rights victories for African Americans did not go, or didn't go far enough, right? Yes. So, no. And I just think if you look at the status of the homosexual in America in say 1950, uh, he was his very existence was illegal. He was medically pathologized. He, he and she, by the way, they were medically pathologized. Uh, they were condemned universally by organized religion, by pretty much every societal, um, every sector of society. Uh, they were conflated with the nation's enemies, with communism. 
And to go from that to where we are today, I mean, this, this is just what you know, public polling or public opinion experts will say, that they have never seen a more dramatic shift. Hmm. I mean, not even going back that far, just looking at gay marriage, right? From where, yeah. where gay marriage was in the early 1990s to where it is today, that alone is the most significant, dramatic, swiftest change um, of any social issue that's recorded in, in public polling. And, and you um, point this out by, by implication when you say the gay president, the president that the gay community openly supported, Bill Clinton, also passed the In Defense of Marriage Act, right? To give you a sense of how it right. looked like it was going backwards. You know, we, this, we gave this guy our support. And so now you're saying now we're seeing that, you know, the, there's a constitutional right to same sex marriage. That yeah. does seem like a gigantic step forward. Yes, absolutely. And it's, you know, uh, I just personally have such a feeling of gratitude having written this book because, I mean, I've, I was born in 1983. So the changes that I've witnessed have been pretty dramatic. But writing this book and going so far back in time yeah. and learning about learning about what it was like to be a gay person in America in the 1940s or 50s, particularly in the city of Washington. Um, it's just made me very, very grateful because uh, I've I personally benefited enormously hmm. um, from this from these from these changes. That's this, so well said. History. It's so well said on a lot of levels. You are yourself a Yale man, right? So you could be very you're very sympathetic to the stories of these Yale men who were homosexuals and what happened to them in government when they ended up getting outed. And you are now you're able to write about them and be number nine on the New York Times bestseller list. That's pretty awesome on the, on the very first day. We'll take one last question from the audience and we'll say goodnight to Jamie. Uh, this comes from Keith Long. Uh, he says, folks is a forum on culture and society. Would James agree that conservatives have always been resistant to integration of homosexual rights in American culture and society? However, even conservatives today can see the writing on the wall and accept the inevitability of homosexual rights legally, socially, culturally going forward? Um, I wouldn't paint with so broad a brush. There have been conservatives um, who were relatively pro-gay rights or pro-gay rights. I mean, Barry Goldwater, you know, was, was um, quite vocally supportive of gays serving in the military. Um, but in general, yes, that's the case. But I think, excuse me, I'm about to sneeze. Um, um, sorry. Um, I do think that the era of gay rights or gay politics, <laughs> excuse me, my allergies. Um, I don't think homosexuality is really a political issue anymore. I think it's moved on to sort of gender identity. And most of this, you know, these bills that are being passed in states across the country, most of the debates that we have now over LGBT rights, they mostly are focused on the gender identity issue, um, which is distinct, I think, from the issue of sexual orientation. Um, so I, uh, I'm actually quite optimistic about um, the, the equality uh, that, that gay people have in this country. So the Parental Rights in Education Act, Florida, which some people say don't say gay, yeah. you don't think really speaks to this. Well, I no, because it does mention sexual orientation. In yeah. its, I, I think it was mostly motivated by gender identity issues, yeah. mm -hmm. but, but it does assail sexual orientation in the text. Right. And so gay people will suffer because of that bill. And I've, I've written against it, um, but we'll, we'll see what happens with it. I don't. All right. Before we say goodnight to Jamie, uh, we have, I think we have a few announcements. We have, we have an event coming up, which we don't have a, a slide for. It's on July 7th, our annual absurdly popular program every year uh, called Law of the Land, uh, the Supreme Court, the annual Supreme Court's annual uh, review. Uh, every year we bring in uh, some few academics who are very good at speaking to the public with mix them up with uh, uh, journalists, we have Ariane de Vogue from CNN this year. We have Mark Stern from Slate. Uh, we have Dean Bill Trainer from Georgetown Law School and uh, a constitutional scholar Tiffany Graham from Turo Law Center. This will be our first live event in over two years with our uh, producing partners, the 92nd Street Y. So that's on July 7th. Uh, you can find out information about that on our website and at the 92nd Street Y. 
We'd love to see everybody live again, but that's July 7th. Uh, yes, if you haven't yet signed up for folks.org to get upcoming events notifications, please do so. And of course, you know, we like to think of ourselves as everyone's favorite uh, pandemic charity. We haven't charged tickets and we've had incredible programming like we did tonight with my good friend, Jamie Kerchick. Uh, for those of you that are looking to buy this book and everyone should buy this book, you know why? You're in very good company. Number nine on the New York Times uh, book review uh, list and it's climbing. Uh, I think if you go to the chat button, uh, there's a link, that's where you can buy it. Uh, as you, you can see, Jamie is incredibly well-spoken, charismatic, and the book reflects that kind of tone. It is a true thriller. It's beautifully written, and you will learn an incredible amount about America, and it'll open you up in a way that you really, as, it, as Jamie has said tonight, there's so many things that he himself learned in going through this archival material. Uh, and for me, you know, I'm of another generation and so it was very eye-opening things I thought I knew and I didn't know at all. You know, every we didn't even so many other people were not discussed in the book. Uh, the Kennedy administration, the Kennedy assassination is discussed in in the, the in the in the language of uh, of the secret city. Uh, Roy Cohn, uh, who of course we know prosecuted the Rosenbergs. It's an endless stream of fascinating stories of people who had to live their lives in the secret city. Um, Jamie, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank uh, you. Uh, until next time, I'm Thane Rosenbaum for folks. Good night, everyone. <laughs>